Hey guys, Jake Carlson here, host of the Modern Leadership Podcast. Are you ready to focus on amplifying your leadership superpowers? Let's go. Good morning, my friends and fellow elite achievers. Welcome to Modern Leadership. How are you today? I hope that you have had a great week so far. You deserve it. Well, hold up. That's an interesting thought, isn't it? You deserve a great week? Or how about you deserve to be happy, to find success, to accomplish your big, hairy, audacious goals? Would you believe me if I said that? Or are you thinking, Jake has lost his mind again? But in all seriousness, think about it. Do you feel like you deserve the life of your dreams? Take a minute and really ponder on this. Like, really think about it. If the answer is no, why not? Why not you? It might be that you are struggling with a case of the imposter syndrome, and if you're not careful, it will stop your progression. So today I have invited an expert on the imposter syndrome, Michelle Gomez, to join us. Michelle is a self-proclaimed reformed corporate burnout and imposter syndrome survivor. She is an accomplished business executive with over two decades experience in the male-dominated transportation and logistics industry. And along the way, she learned to address her own internal imposter and now helps high achievers just like you to do the same. She is the author of Own Your Brilliance, a guide to overcoming the imposter syndrome for career success. And today she is our modern leader. Welcome, Michelle. How are you today? I'm doing well, Jake. Thank you so much for having me. Well, this is going to be a lot of fun. As I was mentioning before we hit record, the imposter syndrome is something that I think we should talk about more often. It's something that I think a lot of elite achievers, a lot of achievers, and a lot of just regular people struggle with on a daily basis. But before we dive into that, what did we miss by way of bio? Ooh, wow. Well, other than the fact that I am a self-proclaimed a reformed corporate burnout. Uh, I'm also a mom and a, uh, a wife and a daughter and a sister and a friend. So uh, I'm all, I'm just like you. I have a lot, I have a lot of hats and I seek to do well at them all. And I'm glad that you added that little part to the, the beginning here, because later on, I want to talk to you about the imposter syndrome in the home. But before we jump into all of that, what is this imposter syndrome? I've said it probably 25 times so far this episode. What is it? So it is a behavioral phenomenon where high achievers struggle to internalize their success. What they do is they tend to explain away their accomplishments rather than owning them. Uh, And they're filled with consistent worry and fear about being discovered as a fraud or a phony among other real deals walking around. And this is real. I mean, this is something that I personally have struggled with all along the way. I've often, you know, when I was in graduate school, I often looked around and thought everybody around here deserves to be here. They're all smart. How did I get in? And so I think everybody or a lot of us are, are struggling with this. So where do we go from here? Well, certainly what I, what I coach people to do in my book is to, you know, you have to call a thing a thing. You can't heal what you can't speak. And so I invite people to look at the imposter syndrome as less of a detriment and more of a stepping stone into owning their brilliance at one point, because most people who struggle with the imposter syndrome, it's pretty common because it's 70% of the population have experienced imposter moments in their strive to achievement. And high achievers experience this particularly. Uh, it's funny that you mentioned grad, stu- grad school as being a time where you felt it because um, it's actually quite prevalent among grads, amongst grad students. And I think it's kind of understood because you're in a, in a course of study trying to gain mastery of something that you may not even be doing just yet, right? Like if you're trying to get a master's degree in, um, I I don't know, uh, literature, you know, or something, you know, and you haven't really, you read, but maybe you don't consider yourself somebody who's sort of a literature connoisseur or you're not, you know, a, a curator of literature. And so you're thinking, I don't, I mean, really, I'm getting a master's degree. I'm, I don't even know what I'm doing. I haven't even, you know, worked in this field at, in not one day, you know? And so it's pretty, uh, it, it's pretty understandable. But what happens is it's important to understand what your competencies are 
of the imposter syndrome, what your triggers are, because then you can start to reframe your thought patterns and and basically, in essence, change how you approach these moments from a place of empowerment. And I like that you talk about high achievers experiencing this, because as you think about it, high achievers, in order to be a high achiever, in order to really propel yourself to be one of these standouts, it requires you to step outside your comfort zone. It it requires you to take on responsibilities, assignments, and other uh, things within your company or within your frame of, of work that you're not ready for. It, it requires you to run a little bit before you're ready to do so. And by doing that and getting outside your comfort zone, all of a sudden you start questioning your abilities. The skills that got you to where you're going, while they may be great, you wonder how they relate to what you're doing now. Does that make sense? Yes, absolutely. I mean, I think it's, it's definitely part of owning your brilliance is to take this inventory of the skills that got you here. Right. I mean, clearly things like discipline and being able to multitask, time management, retention of information, execution. These are all things that, um, among many others, I'm sure that I haven't named yet, uh, that have helped catapult you to achievement. Right. Um, And so understanding that all the hard work, the brunt work that took to get there, finally getting to this place of achievement and not being able to sit in this this position with gratitude and brilliance is something that I find devastating. And that's why I had to finally take control of that in my own career. And once I was able to do the work and break through that, um, I was inspired to help every others do the same because I've seen what it feels like, what it looks like, what it sounds like when someone thrives without this internal negative rhetoric on the constant uh, replay. And I think when you're worried about being the imposter, when you're worried about being found out, it stifles creativity and and your ability to, you know, expand your idea structure or to strategize outside of your comfort zone. And so let's take a step back now. We're talking to achievers here and these achievers are all experiencing this and they understand what you're saying. They hear you. But now how do we start to do something about this because we, we've heard this before. We've, we understand that we're hard workers and we understand, I think, in our core that we have the skills and we have the talents and the abilities. But now all of a sudden when faced in the moment with a, with, you know, a struggle or a challenge, all of a sudden that imposter starts to, to creep up. What are these triggers that you talk about and how do we identify them and then use them to our advantage? Okay, so um, as part of the uh, freebies that we're going to offer to your Modern Leadership listeners, um, I'll be able to share a link with you that you can uh, post in the show notes where your listeners can click and get a f- one of the freebies is a free assessment form. And this form will pr- give a line of questioning that will help you identify what your competencies are. So um, actually, Dr. Valerie Young is a uh, speaker, educator, coach, and author of a book called The Secret Thoughts of Successful Women. And what she uh, talks about are the five competency types. They all have a name and they all have an explanation of what these people or this type would consider as competent. Now, in my book, Own Your Brilliance, um, I coined coined this phrase, the Yukon. I gave it an acronym. It's your unique cocktail of needs. So what you need to feel in order to feel competent or what you need to see uh, in order for something or someone to be competent. And so um, even Dr. Young in her book talks about that there's usually a mix of the five. So somebody might be two out of the five or three out of the five, you know, and I can go down the list and explain them to you. And I, I can almost guarantee that as I explain them and give you a brief uh, synopsis of each one of the competency types, you can probably start to identify your Yukon. Say, okay, I'm 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 a little bit of that one, and yep, I th- that's me too. You <laughs> know, so I can go th- down the list for you. Yeah, let's do that. So you said there's there's five types, and that most people have one or two of them that overlap with each other, and uh, these are triggers for the imposter. These are the uh, things that trigger these voices in your head that make you feel like you're not uh, operating at a level that that maybe your title or position or responsibility level would would necessitate. Is that right? 
close. So the co- the competency types will help you understand what you can you deem competent in your own approach to tasks or or goals or anything like that. But the triggers that would follow would would identify where these would show up. I'll give you an example. So the perfectionist is the, the top one. The perfectionist basically the perfectionist uh, tends to focus on how something is done. Um, you have an extremely high expectation of yourself and you tend to set the bar very high. When you do not achieve your goal at the high level expectation you set for yourself, you're likely to experience harsh inner criticism and shame, which can take days to shake off. So if you're the perfectionist type and this is how you deem competent. So if you get, uh, if you're in a, in a grad school, let's say, and you type a paper and you expect it to be a hundred percent. You expect your paper to grade to be 100%. And when you get it back, it's an 89 or a 92. Well, there goes the shame and the shame is invoked and it's going to be a part of your experience for probably a few days. And I do a lot of coaching with lawyers and I see this a lot. Lawyers hate to be wrong. In fact, it's a culture within the legal profession not to ask a question you don't already know the answer to because you don't want to appear weak or appear that you don't have all your ducks in a row. And so I'm dealing with this on a daily basis, including myself. I see a lot of myself in this. Perfectionists want to see everything come out exactly how they played it out in their mind prior to the situation uh, occurring. Is that what we're hearing? Yes, they want to be able to anticipate all the, uh, they're, they're like natural warriors, you know, they want to be able to anticipate anything that could possibly go wrong. And, um, and here's where the explanation kind of comes in, because if like this, for example, the scenario I just talked about, if they do get a 92 on your term paper, um, they can say something like, oh, well, I didn't study as hard or truthfully, I only gave myself two hours to write that paper. So I guess 92 is what I deserve. Instead of saying, you know what, 92 is actually not bad. I'm in grad school and I just got a 92 on a term paper. You know what, I, I'm going to go ahead and go buy myself a, an ice cream cone because I deserve a little something for that. You know, <laughs> like they don't, it's, it's always, uh, it's, it's kind of reminds me of Ricky Bobby. You're either first, if you're not first, you're last. That's the way the perfectionist thinks. If they don't have a perfect score, if they're not first, then why bother? I'm, I'm out. And I see this a lot of, of in, in a lot of our attorney friends and also in a lot of our elite achievers that basically they have an outcome already predetermined in their mind and they've already basically walked the stepping stones to get there. And all of a sudden they realize that as they've walked these stones, it didn't lead to where they thought it would lead. And that results in their identifying themselves as a failure rather than just understanding that, you know, a mistake was made or a failure happened and not necessarily who they are individually. Agreed. Yes, it's what you did, not who you are. Perfect. You see how I transition there? Perfect. Perfectionism. What's number two? Number two is the natural genius. So the natural genius, you expect to have natural abilities, an easy flow of intelligence that would result in being able to approach a task or goal with the utmost of ease. If the task doesn't seem easy for you, the assumption is that you're just not cut out for this. You, you beat yourself up for not being naturally inclined for this task or this line of work and you experience shame. And so I find I find this uh, particular competency kind of comical in a sense, because, uh, you know, I find this a lot in entrepreneurs, um, especially new entrepreneurs. You know, they think uh, you start a business and you should be making six figures in, in six months. Um uh, and so they assume if they're not making six figures and they're not flexing on Instagram with their, you know, Lamborghinis and their beach homes that uh, then they're clearly not good at this. And then they give up. I mean, that's why the entrepreneurial world is so prominent. But also there's such turnover because people start and then as quickly as they start, they quickly nosedive. And so, um, you know, there's little room for growth because they just so people who struggle with the competency of imposter syndrome in the natural genius spectrum, that's where they go to. They just experience the shame. Like, what was I thinking? I shouldn't have even started this. I mean, I, I should have known I'm not good at that. So since I didn't make six figures before the end of my first year in business, I'm, I'm clearly not cut out for this. So I'm just going to pull out. 
And I had a conversation earlier today with someone about this exact topic, that there are more and more people entering the entrepreneurial space because it's easier than ever. The internet has created an opportunity for us to enter this space, maybe before we're ready, before we're prepared, and that we don't know how to face the competition. Now, Michelle, I wanted to ask you specifically on this natural genius one. Uh, originally when you started talking, when you first started talking, my first thought was, you know, as, as a kid who maybe grew up as a high school football player, you know, and got drafted to college. And then as, as he goes up through the ranks of his sport, and in this case, just for example purposes, I'm using football as the, the funnel gets narrower and narrower, as the competition gets higher and higher, the natural genius who, who maybe was a big star in a small pond is now, you know, a small star in a big pond. Uh, I could see that as one of the triggers for this natural genius. Is that, is that what you're thinking? I mean, it's certainly in line. It's certainly a a viable experience because, yeah, if they've just had a natural progression and they've just been like the star player and, you know, invited to to be a part of something without much uh, effort, you know, they just kind of show up. You know, it's it's easy for them to assume like, okay, I'm natural at this. Clearly, this was meant for me. You know, but then on the flip side, uh, the imposter syndrome experience could also make you feel just disqual- it's so it's so it, it's such a double edged sword because you can look at it as the natural genius does and says well clearly I'm meant for this I mean I just kind of walked in here and look at everything is being thrown my way all these opportunities I mean this is clearly meant to be but w- then there's a part of you where there you have arrived right and then you look around and you're like you know I didn't really work that hard for this do I really deserve to be here like I, I'm sure there's so many other people out there that worked way harder than I have, they probably deserve this better than I do or more than I do. And this thought that what got you here isn't going to get you there. I mean, the talents and skills that you had coming into this situation and scenario. And this is, I think, going back to as we talk about entrepreneurs, you know, they've been successful in school or they've been successful in other employment opportunities, other ventures that they naturally believe that they're going to be able to be successful in this other venture or like the football player who says I can play football, you know, give me some, you know, give me a baseball glove and a baseball and I, I can go out there and be great at that as well. And then all of a sudden having this realization, this feeling that, you know, the, the environment is much different here. Yes. And, you know, the natural genius is also something I've known, I've seen in um, just personal interactions, um, not just in the workforce. Like, for example, somebody, um, if you if you have a group of people that are playing, you know, having a game night, for example, you know, and one person in the group is the only person who doesn't know how to play a card game, let's say spades, and um, everyone in the group knows how to play, except this one person doesn't know how to play. If that person considers themselves a natural genius, they will not sit down and learn like they need to know. No, I need to not only know this game, I need to own this game because I'm only going to play if I'm going to win. And you can see how this is limiting their ability to grow, to learn new things and develop into a more rounded leader. Yes. All right. So natural genius is perfectionist. What do we go for? Number three, the expert. So the expert believes that true competency is possessing as much knowledge and skill as possible a retention of information that gives them the ability to execute all forms of mastery. Seeking out all forms of credentials or experience to is what drives their actions. Um, you have to go back. If you have to go back and read that book again or struggle to master something new the first time, or you're not constantly seeking new forms of training or certification, you feel stagnant, impotent and you're shrouded in shame. So I call this competency always thriving, never arriving. This is the ready aim, 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 and never firing because they're constantly in the process of learning and, and doing more. And I, by the way, you know, I thought of myself as a perfectionist. I also think that I struggle with this imposter syndrome as an expert as well, because I'm constantly reading. I'm constantly studying. At some point, you've got to act. You've got to just move forward. You're never going to know everything there is to know. Yep. Yep. That's true. And, and it's, you know, I think that expecting yourself to retain everything first time you've read the book is, you know, is a little unrealistic, but this is what they deem as competent. You know, um, I'm like you, I read a book a month. I'm, I'm always reading. And even, and I'm a big self-help, um, 
book junkie and I like leadership books. Um, and I may not remember everything, but I always try to take one key point, you know, one takeaway from the book. I can go down the books in my, in my shelf and say, okay, from this book, I learned this. And from this book, I remember this story. And for this book, I changed the way I deal with such and such, you know? And so you not, but you're not going to remember everything that the book had to offer from cover to cover. Right. Um, so, but with the expert, that's what they deem as incompetent. If you have to go back and read that again, because you just, it should come to you naturally. Um, and if you're not always consistently trying to thrive, trying to learn, trying to master, trying to get another degree, trying to get another certification, try, and I, and I, th- that's how they sort of justify not executing at the end level. Like now, okay, you've got the degree, you've got the business, you've got this, you've got the team, you got, okay, let's go. Okay, come on, come on, turn, turn the ignition. Come, come on, step on the gas. Come on, you know. But they're like, no, 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 wait. I still have to. It's like I'm sitting in the car. I still have to adjust my mirrors. Well, I, let me, uh, let me fix my seatbelt. Or wait, uh, there's trash on the floor here. Let me clean that up. Dude, just go. <laughs> you know. And so that's that's what I that's the expert. And I've seen that in a few of the people that I've worked with. Um, people that you know go for you know go for like four or five different bachelor's degrees. What is your ultimate outcome? What is your end goal? What I find interesting, Michelle, so far as we've gone through these first three is we're really talking about extremes, right? The perfectionist is someone who takes perfectionism and doing it perfect to the extreme or the natural genius of believing that, you know, if they're not great at something, then they shouldn't do it at all. Or the expert that must continue to learn to the extreme level. That what we're not saying is that trying to be the best as far as perfectionism, trying to be as close to as good at something as possible is a bad thing. Or being an expert, studying and and really knowing your area of influence, your area, your topic area. We're not saying that these are bad things. What we're saying is when they're taken to the extreme that they stop your progression. Remember how we started this conversation. Imposter syndrome is basically stopping you from progressing. And so as we look at this, if you feel like you're stagnant, if you feel like you're spinning your wheels in the mud a little bit, and this is resonating with you, do you find that you're an expert? trying to spin your wheels on learning and learning and learning and never actually doing. And so, Michelle, those are the top three. What's number four? The rugged individualist, excuse me, the rugged individualist, also known as the soloist. So basically for them, their thought is that true competence is in the person who can approach a task or goal all on their own. No help or assistance or aid of any kind. The thought behind this competency is that if you were to need help, Asking for it would solidify the fact that you clearly are phony. You don't know what you're doing. And feeling that you need help then invites the shame into your experience. This is so huge. I mean, this this one just struck a light bulb with me because I see this all over the place, particularly when you look at entrepreneurs or people starting out. Because by necessity, when you're starting a business, whether you're starting a small business or whether you're doing something online, by necessity, you're probably by yourself or with a small group of people. And in order to grow, you need to take your business to the next level, which is going to require you to give responsibilities to other people. And what we're talking about here is people who believe if you are an entrepreneur who believes that only you can do the assignment, only you can do the work, or by bringing somebody on and giving away some of your control, that the quality of your project or your service is going to go down. Well, this is the imposter syndrome stopping you from going to the next level. And Michelle, I'm seeing this day in and day out in our, in our young entrepreneurs and in our solo businesses. Yes, it's also something you could see in leaders if we're not careful. I mean, anyone who has done some of the work to be the best leader that they can be, the best manager that they can be, knows the power of delegation. And delegating really uh, helps you establish a team because you trust them with certain tasks and you empower them to perform those tasks to the best of their ability. But then it frees up your time as a leader to be creative innovative, rapport building, you know, be present in what's going on instead of being tied to the mundane tasks. And unfortunately, this rugged individualist competency is sort of an identifying factor between a manager and a leader. Clearly, maybe some people who were, were 
poised or positioned to be a leader struggle to be that leader because they're too focused on being a manager, holding on to all these tasks because they take such pride in doing these tasks all by themselves. Just because you can do it doesn't mean you should do it. And I often talk about this with the people that I coach with, and that is you should delegate down to the lowest compensated employee competent competent enough to do the job. Like just because you can answer the phone doesn't mean you should be answering the phone. Just because you can fill an order doesn't mean you should be back in the in the shop room, you know, putting tape on the box. Just because you can do something doesn't mean you should do it. The imposter syndrome stopping you from becoming the leader that you need to be. What's our fifth one, Michelle? Fifth and last one is the superwoman slash man slash student. So it could kind of hit all three. But basically, your belief is that you should be able to fulfill all of your duties masterfully. Now, this one is probably really high on the totem pole for women, because that means we want to be the best wife, mother, sister, daughter, friend, employee, student, athlete. Like we just want to be able to excel at all of our hats. And um, and that's uh, it's something we struggle with. So that's why being the superwoman or the superman or the super student is being able to juggle it all and make it look easy. And that's what drives your idea of competence. If you're not handling your business awesomely and all the hats you wear, then clearly you're a fraud and in comes the shame. So um, this is why men struggle with the two students, the the grad students. That's why he's part of the super student. It's, um, it shows up at work by being the first one in the office and being the last one to leave, working, you know, working even from home, got your laptop open, you know, on the weekends, you're answering email, you're, you're um, so focused on work, that work is now your identifying factor for your confidence level or your value. And so you have to be this super human in order to show how competent you are. Like it, it, there's ways to be competent without driving yourself into the ground, right? But um, for this particular competency type, it unfortunately, this particular one um, has a negative impact on personal lives as well. Marriages, parenting, home life, health. So I want to throw this one back at you and ask a question that might be a little difficult because one of the things that we believe in at Modern Leadership is trying to be the EST, whether it's the fastest, the smartest, the greatest, the cheapest, whatever it is, we want to become the EST in our field. And how is that different from struggling with the Superman, Superwoman, Super Student syndrome? My perspective on that is that you can be the best at something, you know, the fastest, the strongest, the wisest, the, you know, what whatever EST you want to be in your field. But I believe that in order to achieve that tip top ability, you have to take care of yourself. You have to have personal care, self care, enough sleep, uh, some sort of mindfulness practice that will g- give you some value with yourself, some time with yourself outside of what you can do. Like it's important to have value in just who you are as a person, as an individual with the unique set of gifts and talents that you've been blessed with. It shouldn't solely be um, placed on the measurement of what you can do for somebody else or what you can what you can manifest or what product you can develop. There's a time and place for that, but you're so much more than that, than just what you can do. You're still a person and behind every person, there's there's a life. There's a home, there's marriages, there's children, there's parents, you know, there's there's health matters to focus on. Um, And so that's why my goal when I when I coach people is to try to balance that. You can be the best at what you do, but you don't have to do it at this at the sacrifice of your health and your home life. That's a great response. Thank you for taking the time to go down that path with us. I got a couple more questions I want to talk to you about. One of them is, can we go too far with this imposter syndrome as far as on the opposite end and become arrogant? If we do, um, from what I can tell, I mean, I struggle with, I, you know, the imposter syndrome doesn't really go away. It's something that you have to manage, right? It's, I, I kind of uh, alluded to an allergy. You know, that's why the triggers are so important. Just like with an allergy, you already know I'm allergic to this. So if you know if you're going to be in the presence of that, then you do what you have to do to prepare, you know? So understanding your competencies, then you can figure out what your triggers are and you can reframe your thought pattern before you get there. Um, you can, I think with arrogance, it could teeter because of the fear. 
because clearly shame, the reason why shame is a part of all of this is because it invokes fear. There's a fear of being found out. There's a fear of coming off as incompetent. There's a fear of people seeing what you think they see when they don't see it. (laughs) This is just what you see. And so, um, whether that can go to arrogance, I personally don't feel it can. I think that just getting people to own their skill set and own their brilliance is just getting them to be accepting of what they have as far as value. With arrogance, I find that it's less about who they are as people and more about what they can do, like we just talked about. And so when they see what they can do for people, they want to boast about how, look at me, I'm so awesome, I'm great, and and look at what I can do with the power of my hands, look at my output, you know. But then at the end of the day, at the end of the day, when they go back home or, or the lights in the office are off, the applause stop, then the real matter of how they feel about themselves shows up. So I think arrogance is just a mask for, for fear and loneliness, you know, and for a devalue of who they are as people. Now, for with with um, with the imposter syndrome, it's it, it's not necessarily arrogance. It's just getting them to see what we see. You know, I think this was a great response, Michelle. And what it really triggered for me is that this imposter syndrome is something internal. It's something you're dealing with on the inside, whereas arrogance is something external. It's something that you're projecting out to other people. And so I really appreciate you going down that path for us. Uh, The last question I wanted to ask about before we get into our next section, and that is uh, imposter syndrome in the home as parents I feel like, you know, we've had a a big conversation about the business environment, the work environment, but does this not show up also as parents? Absolutely, especially for that final competency. Uh, I mean, I think we can go down the line and kind of point it out and, and, you know, and everything. But like, for example, the superwoman. So if you were like myself three years ago, very good at your job, doing really well at work, everyone at work got all of their needs met, 80% of my heart, mind, soul, spirit went into my work because that's where my identity was. And so when you give 80% of yourself to your career, then that leaves only 20% and that everyone else has to kind of divvy up. So that's your, your marriage, your children, and find time to work out, find time to sleep, you know, and I, you know, there was a, a part of me at one point that was like, gosh, you know what, this, my husband's going to leave me at some point because I don't see any man dealing with this, you know, or like my kids are going to resent me so much when they get older because mom just worked way too much. Mom is not even here. I'm not even present, you know? Um, and so it's easy to let your imposter syndrome competency sort of take over how you deal with things because how often have we heard the way you do one thing is the way you do everything. And we hear that often, right? Oh yeah. I'm a big believer in it. Right. And so, um, when you're one person and you give 80% of yourself to your career, because that's where your identity seems to lie at the time, how is it possible to give 80% to, to, to mothering or 80% to your marriage? It's like, there's no way there's only a hundred percent of you. So there's no other, there's no clones, you know, there's no, uh, minions that you can have show up for you. And so, um, it can certainly show up in how, what you have left to give. Is, and because if the imposter syndrome is driving so much of yourself to one thing or uh, it's off balance, then it's easy to feel like a failure in all the other arenas. Even if 20 percent is OK, you know, the kids aren't the kids are getting fed. You know, yeah, the laundry's getting done eventually. You know, dinner will be served at some point. It may not be, you know, a gourmet meal. I might have stopped at KFC and grabbed a bucket of chicken for the night, you know. But, but the kids aren't starving, you know, so you can start to really your your wheels will turn. But at the end of the night, even if the kids are fed and the homework's done and the husband's not complaining, you're already going into that shame factor, that fear that, oh, my gosh, it's only a matter of time before he starts having an affair. It's only a matter of time before my kids start to, you know, build up that resentment towards me, you know. And so the same thing for the others, like the perfectionist, if your kids aren't perfect, if your marriage isn't perfect, in comes the shame. The natural genius, if you're not just a natural parent, or if, you're, if your marriage isn't just flowing naturally, like it's the honeymoon every day of the week, it's easy to, to invoke the shame. The expert, like the, if you need help, 
the expert or the rugged individualist, if you need to seek counseling or you need to seek parenting advice, seek assistance, or you don't remember exactly everything you read from that last parenting book and you didn't execute properly, then anytime you see um, a dip in your parenting or a dip in your kid's behavior or a, a, a tough week in your marriage, it's easy to blame yourself. Because you're like, gosh, I should have, I'm the expert. I should have just known this stuff. I should have remembered that book I read two years ago and should have executed by now, you know? And so I think it certainly does with the imposter syndrome show up in your personal lives. But this is why I am so passionate about this and my work, because you heard that phrase, happy wife, happy life. Happy wife, happy life. You betcha. Right. Um, may I ask, Jake, are you married? I am. And my wife's happy, happy life. Lovely. So, uh, and I think it's so funny when I hear husbands speak about this, they said, it's so true. You know, when my wife is not happy, the whole house can feel it. And so, um, when a woman stands in her sense of grace and her empowerment at home, right? There's so such beauty in that. When a woman is happy at home, she knows her place in her husband's heart. She knows that she's doing right by her children. She looks at her home and, and she's, comfortable in her home. She feels like she's giving it time. And so she can, you can see it in her. She radiates this empowerment, right? And everybody benefits. You're happy. The kids are happy. It's harmonious. It's comfortable. It's, it's peaceful, right? And, and you see, wow, this home is thriving because she's thriving because she's confident and solidified in her position in this house. Now I'm trying to bring that same sentiment into a woman's career. Imagine if a woman can just overcome this imposter syndrome stuff and own her brilliance at work. The same level of harmony, of productivity, of engagement can be experienced in the workforce if she just lets herself do that. And I believe that this can go just as well for men as it can for women. And the way that we get to this, the way that we overcome this imposter syndrome, and I think this takes us full circle for how we started the podcast, and that is you need to identify the triggers. You need to identify when that imposter syndrome is rearing its head. And so once you're conscious of it, once you're intentionally focused on it, well, then you can combat it. You can stop it in its tracks and you can not let it hinder you and you can implement actions to move forward. Now, Michelle, I look at our time and we've gone a little bit over. Before I let you go, we have a section I love called Learning from Leaders where we find a little bit more about you. Are you ready for that section? I am. All right. So our first question then is the book currently on your Kindle or bedside table? I am reading What If It Does Work Out by Susie Moore. Which is such a great title when you think about what we've just talked about for the last 35 minutes. What if it does work out? That's the imposter syndrome, the opposite of the imposter syndrome. It's what would happen if things were going your way? Uh, Next question then is your leadership superpower. I'm the inspirational leader. I love it. And we could hear it through your voice and through this whole conversation. Inspiration is so important. How about a motivational quote, philosophy, or mantra, something that you live by? I live by the uh, Daring Greatly quote by um, Theodore Roosevelt. It's not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes up short again and again, but because there is no effort without error and shortcoming, but who does actually strive to do the deeds who knows the great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who at worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring great. What a great inspirational quote. And I think this is a wonderful place for us to move to the final question, and that is, how can we learn more about you? How can we find out about this assessment that you talked about and connect more with you and your inspirational coaching? 
Okay. Well, actually, I, I'm going to provide you with a link for your listeners. And what your listeners can do is go on there and send you directly to my site, directly for you guys, just you guys. So it's really special for you. And what you'll get is access to a couple of freebies. You'll either get access to a um, assessment form for your imposter syndrome Yukon to identify what your competencies are and your triggers. Um, you can also get a free copy of my book. An ebook copy will come your way of own your brilliance. Or if you want to schedule a free 30 minute strategy session with me to discuss how this is showing up in your work life and how we can work through it so that you can own your brilliance and achieve the career success that you deserve. And so what's that link? It is www.michellem, my middle initial, gomez, G-O-M-E-Z dot com slash ML for modern leadership. Wonderful. And we're going to link all of that up on the show notes for this page. What a great offer to get your entire book free and read through it and grab all of this. I think you're a real believer in the things that you teach. You want to get it into the hands of more and more people. And I think this is a wonderful opportunity. We'll link all of it up on the show notes and send people your way. Michelle, can't thank you enough for being this week's Modern Leader. Thank you for bringing the imposter syndrome conversation to the podcast. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. All right, my friends, thank you for joining us on this episode of Modern Leadership and a big thanks to Michelle for coming on and sharing with us about the imposter syndrome. You know, this is a topic I love to talk about because it's something that we all struggle with. I mean, be honest. We all struggle with it to a certain degree, right? At some point or in some situation, you've thought to yourself, I'm not supposed to be here. This group is more talented or has worked harder. I shouldn't be here. I remember when I first did my first episode of the podcast and I recorded it for three and a half hours. I kept re-recording. I kept stopping because in my mind, I didn't deserve to be on iTunes like the rest of the great podcasters. You know, and you just got to get over it. The world needs to hear your voice. You have great stuff within you. Go out and, and squash that imposter. Go out there Know that you have the abilities, the skills to stand in any arena that you're faced with, that you've been given the opportunity. You've worked hard. You deserve it. Remember how we started this episode. You deserve to have a great week. You deserve to work hard on your goals and to have the accomplishments. You deserve to create the life of your dreams. And so with that, of course, everything that we talked about on this episode can be found on the show notes, jakeacarlson.com slash ML90, episode 90, so ML90. And of course, next week we will have another episode. But until then, I want to wish you the very best of days, an even better life, and of course, stay awesome. Thanks for listening to the Modern Leadership Podcast. You can find me on Facebook at Speaker Jake, on Twitter at Jake A. Carlson, and of course the website, jakeacarlson.com. See you there. Uh-huh.